If you would, to turn with me in the New Testament to the Gospel of Mark. And I just want to share this just briefly here because not everyone knows this, and I realize that. Our Bible is divided up into two parts. You have the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament at the beginning, you'll find 33 books there, 39 books, 33 books. I'll get it right here in a second. And uh, in the New Testament, you have 27 books. And so we are in the New Testament. And when you find the New Testament, then it's Matthew and Mark is the second book that you'll come across. And so Mark chapter 10 is where we're reading from this morning. I'll ask you to stand in honor of and reverence to God's word and remain standing also for prayer. While I'm praying, we'll dismiss our children to junior church and children's church at that time. Now this is a lengthy passage, and I realize that. That's one of the reasons I'm reading it today. But we're going to read verses 32 through verse 35. And I want you to begin to uh, think about the story of what took place here that day, okay? Beginning in verse 32 of Mark chapter 10, the Bible says this, And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed, and all that followed, they were afraid. And he took the twelve, again the twelve, and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, and now Jesus is going to predict his death. He says, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and to the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. And verse 35 says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we want to know... Or basically what they're saying is, you said we can ask anything. And so they come to him, and they say, we have a question for you. Now, verse 37 is the question. I want you to follow along here because verse 37 is very important. James and John ask a question of Jesus, and they say, They said unto him, Grant unto us that we might sit one on thy right hand and one on thy left hand in glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with, ye shall be baptized. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you today, Lord. We thank you today that you have given us this opportunity, Lord, to stand in your house, to worship you, to serve you. But more importantly, God, we are here today. To preach from your word. And so God I would ask that you would just help me as I stand here. I realize I am a sinner. And Lord I stand here as a sinner. And I need forgiveness of my own sin. And my own life. And so Lord I'm, I'm pleading the blood of Jesus. And asking you to forgive me of every sin. That's in my life. Lord help us today as we study this passage. I pray that you would give us understanding. That perhaps we never had before. Lord make it real to each and every one of us. Help us to apply it to our life. Lord, I pray that you would be honored in it all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Please leave your Bible open here to Mark chapter 10. Now, I generally don't give a lot of titles to messages, but this one I think is very fitting. If you want to be great. That's because we're going to talk about two primary things. We're going to talk about being a leader, and we're going to talk about being a servant. In our society today, I would say that People in general place a very high value on uh, prominence and stature, things that you have, things that you have accomplished. My question to you is, as we read a text such as this, how does that play out in the church? As Christians, what do we do with that? As evangelicals, I mean, honestly, what are we going to do with this issue of leadership and this issue of servanthood and the fact that not everybody is a pre uh, preeminent person, predominant person? Well, today we're going to look at a couple things. I've already told you we're going to look at leadership, but we're specific, specifically going to look at what it means to be a servant, what servant leadership really is. So let's just ask a couple questions today to get our minds rolling, and perhaps we can start thinking about some of these things. Now, the first question I'm going to ask you is, what is leadership? And I'm also going to ask you, what is a servant? Then I'm going to ask you a simple question. What's the proper way that you and I, as a Christian, as a child of God, should serve? 
Let me be the first to tell you there is a misconception in many churches today about what ministry really is all about. Too often, as I already mentioned, we equate uh, celebrity and we equate, uh, equate uh, all this glamour with ministry. And so ministry is thought of as some high-profile stuff. There was a televangelist that came under fire this past week because he had bought his wife a uh, Lamborghini. And as a result of that, many people were giving their comments about that, what they thought a pastor should and shouldn't do. And um, I'll just go on record and say this pastor is not going to buy his wife a Lamborghini, but to each the wrong. <laughs> Um, unless we want to pass that offering plate around about seven more times, then maybe <laughs> that could be a possibility. But uh, it became a, a great um, topic of discussion. And so really this, this uh, thought came out, well, if a person is in leadership, don't they deserve to have better things? And in fact, society has kind of built that view. But when we go back to Mark chapter 10, we find that Jesus presented to his disciples a very real and a very new model of what leadership really is. In fact, the model that Jesus followed is the model he expects all of us to follow. Now, you may not realize this, but you are a leader in some way. You lead someone, whether it's a family, whether it's a husband and wife situation, whether it's on your job, you will always in some way, some form, be put in a position of leadership. And so Jesus is going to talk about that exact subject. Now, let's think about what we just read. What happened here? Well, Jesus begins to tell this story by talking about his impending death. He is saying to his disciples, hey, guys, I'm going to die. And it's not just that I'm going to die. He says, I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be spat upon. And I'm going to be killed. And then Jesus makes a very interesting statement. And he tells them that on the third day, he's going to rise from the grave. Now. If you were sitting with Jesus that day, I want you to put yourself in this story, in this picture. <laughs> You're sitting there with Jesus. He just pours his heart out to you. And he says, I'm going to die. People's going to beat me. They're going to mock me. They're going to lie about me. They're going to do all these things. And then I'm going to rise again. What would be the next thing that you as a human being would say to Jesus? Well, we have the disciples' response, at least two of them, James and John. Go back to verse 35 in Mark chapter 10. And uh, I want you to see this. So verse 35, it says, And James and John came to Jesus and said, Master, we know that we can ask you anything. And then, in verse 36, Jesus said, uh, And they, he said unto them, What do you want? Very good question, right? I want you to notice verse 37. Because here's the request after Jesus has just told the man closest to him, I'm going to die. I'm going to be lied about. I'm going to be... A spit upon them, I'm going to be mocked. And what do they ask Jesus? Verse 37, they said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on your right hand and one on your left when you get to heaven. I look at that and I say, wow. Are those the kind of friends that you want around you? They know who you are. They know you're going to die. And they say, oh, by the way, when you get to heaven, can I be on your right? Or can I be on your left? We want to be top dogs. That's what they're saying. <laughs> We want to be someone that's, that's thought of very highly. Now, we probably shouldn't be too quick to judge James and John for being ambitious. Because leaders should be ambitious. In fact, I'll tell you something. As a pastor, there have been many times where I wish I had just a few people like James and John that were willing to step up and say, I'm willing to do whatever you need at any cost. Anyone that is in a leadership position, whether it's on the job, whether it's in the church, or regardless, you would love to have people like that. But these guys had some good things coming to them. Jesus is getting ready to teach them a very important lesson. In fact, he's going to give them some characteristics of leadership He's going to identify them in him, in them, but he's also going to show you and I as a leader some characteristics that we should have in our life as leaders. I want you to see quickly what they are. Characteristic number one, write this down. This is in your outline in your bulletin. James and John. They were men of vision. Now jump that down. They were men of vision. Now you need to ask yourself as a leader in whatever area that you lead in, are you a person? A vision. Jesus had just told them that he was going to die, and they had 
tremendous faith. Remember, these guys, they were in the inner circle with Jesus. They had tremendous faith. They understood who Jesus was. They believed he was exactly who he said he was, and they wanted to be part of it. Now, let me just acknowledge that a true leader can get people to be part of the vision, get people to be part of the plan. These men were men of vision. They knew who Jesus really was, and they wanted to be part of that. Now, most of us would probably say that's where we fail. We, we have vision. We know where we want to go. We know what we want to do. We know what we want people to help us do. It's that we have trouble portraying that. But to these men, it was their, their life. And so, number one, they were men of vision. No doubt about that, right? Well, I want you to notice a second characteristic and jot this down as well. They were also willing to pay the price. Every true leader can not only be a person of great vision, but they themselves have to be willing to pay the price. Jesus asked them very plainly in verse 38. I want you to go back there in Mark uh, chapter 10 and look at that verse 38. He asked the question, can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Now, do you know what Jesus is asking them? He's saying, are you willing to suffer because of me. Now, folks, listen, I've had a few jobs in my lifetime. Never in an interview has anyone ever said to me, I am going to be your leader. I am going to be attacked. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be lied about. I'm going to be sped upon. Are you willing to have people do that to you as well because you are under my leadership? Mm. I'd probably get up and run out of the interview if I said <laughs> that. I would think, what, what kind of person am I getting ready to work for? Well, the truth of the matter is, that's the world we live in. But Jesus is taking this from a spiritual standpoint, and he is saying, I'm going to die, guys. Are you really willing to suffer the way that I suffer? And James and John very quickly spoke up and stood up, and they said, absolutely, Jesus, we are ready to do whatever it takes. Now, church history tells us that John was the only of the disciples that died of old age. But do you know John was banished to the Isle of Patmos? And while he was there, they boiled him in a pot of oil, trying to kill him in a slow death. He miraculously lived. I would say John was willing to pay the price. James was murdered by Herod. He didn't run from it. He knew that it was coming. And so these men knew that there was going to be a price in serving Jesus, but they was willing to pay that price. Now keep in mind, at this point, we're talking about leadership. Are we a person of vision? Are we people willing to pay the price? Well, there's a third characteristic that's found in true leaders, godly leaders. And I want you to write this down as well. They weren't afraid of being unpopular. They were not afraid of being unpopular. I do not want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. That doesn't mean as a leader you have a right to be arrogant. It's not accomplished. My question to you is, as we read a text such as this, how does that play out in the church? As Christians, what do we do with that? As evangelicals, I mean, honestly, what are we going to do with this issue of leadership and this issue of servanthood and the fact that not everybody is a pre uh, preeminent person, predominant person? Well, today we're going to look at a couple things. I've already told you we're going to look at leadership, but we're specific, specifically going to look at what it means to be a servant, what servant leadership really is. So let's just ask a couple questions today to get our minds rolling, and perhaps we can start thinking about some of these things. Now, the first question I'm going to ask you is, what is leadership? And I'm also going to ask you, what is a servant? Then I'm going to ask you a simple question. What's the proper way that you and I, as a Christian, as a child of God, should serve? Let me be the first to tell you there is a misconception in many churches today about what ministry really is all about. Too often, as I already mentioned, we equate uh, celebrity and we equate, uh, equate uh, all this glamour with ministry. And so ministry is thought of as some high-profile stuff. There was a televangelist that came under fire this past week because he had bought his wife a uh, Lamborghini. 
And as a result of that, many people were giving their comments about that, what they thought a pastor should and shouldn't do. And uh, I'll just go on record and say this pastor is not about his wife, a Lamborghini, but to each the wrong. Uh, unless we want to pass that offering plate around about seven more times, then maybe <laughs> that could be a possibility. But uh, it became a, a great um, topic of discussion. And so really this, this uh, thought came out, well, if a person is in leadership, don't they deserve to have better things? And in fact, society has kind of built that view. But when we go back to Mark chapter 10, we find that Jesus presented to his disciples a very real and a very new model of what leadership really is. In fact, the model that Jesus followed is the model he expects all of us to follow. Now, you may not realize this, but you are a leader in some way. You lead someone, whether it's a family, whether it's a husband and wife situation, whether it's on your job, you will always in some way, some form, be put in a position of leadership. And so Jesus is going to talk about that exact subject. Now let's think about what we just read. What happened here? Well, Jesus begins to tell this story by talking about his impending death. He is saying to his disciples, hey guys, I'm going to die. And it's not just that I'm going to die. He says, I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be spat upon. And I'm going to be killed. And then Jesus makes a very interesting statement. And he tells them that on the third day, he's going to rise from the grave. Now, if you were sitting with Jesus that day, I want you to put yourself in this story, in this picture. <coughs> You're sitting there with Jesus. He just pours his heart out to you. And he says, I'm going to die. People's going to beat me. They're going to mock me. They're going to lie about me. They're going to do all these things. And then I'm going to rise again. What would be the next thing that you as a human being would say to Jesus? Well, we have the disciples' response, at least two of them, James and John. Go back to verse 35 in Mark chapter 10. And uh, I want you to see this. In so verse 35, it says, And James and John came to Jesus and said, Master, we know that we could ask you anything. And then, in verse 36, Jesus said, uh, And they, he said unto them, What do you want? Very good question, right? I want you to notice verse 37. Because here's the request after Jesus has just told the man closest to him, I'm going to die, I'm going to be lied about, I'm going to be uh, spit upon, I'm going to be mocked. And what do they ask Jesus? Verse 37, they said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on your right hand and one on your left when you get to heaven. I look at that and I say, wow. Are those the kind of friends that you want around you? They know who you are. They know you're going to die. And they say, oh, by the way, when you get to heaven, can I be on your right? Or can I be on your left? We want to be top dogs. That's what they're saying. <laughs> we want to be someone that's, that's thought of very highly. Now, we probably shouldn't be too quick to judge James and John for being ambitious. Because leaders should be ambitious. In fact, I'll tell you something. As a pastor, there have been many times where I wish I had just a few people like James and John that were willing to step up and say, I'm willing to do whatever you need at any cost. Anyone that is in a leadership position, whether it's on the job, whether it's in the church, or regardless, you would love to have people like that. But these guys had some good things coming to them. Jesus is getting ready to teach them a very important lesson. In fact, he's going to give them some characteristics of leadership He's going to identify them in him, in them, but he's also going to show you and I as a leader some characteristics that we should have in our life as leaders. I want you to see quickly what they are. Characteristic number one, write this down. This is in your outline in your bulletin. James and John. They were men of vision. Now jump that down. They were men of vision. Now you need to ask yourself as a leader in whatever area that you lead in, are you a person? A vision. Jesus had just told them that he was going to die. And they had tremendous faith. Remember, these guys, they were in the inner circle with Jesus. They had tremendous faith. They understood who Jesus was. They believed he was exactly who he said he was. And they wanted to be part of it. Now let me just acknowledge that a true leader can get people to be part of the vision. To get people to be part of the plan. These men were men of vision. They knew who Jesus was really was. And they wanted to be part of that. Now, most of us would probably say that's where we fell. 
We, we have vision. We know where we want to go. We know what we want to do. We know what we want people to help us do. It's that we have trouble portraying that. But to these men, it was their, their life. And so number one, they were men of vision. No doubt about that, right? Well, I want you to notice a second characteristic and jot this down as well. They were also willing to pay the price. Every true leader can not only be a person of great vision, but they themselves have to be willing to pay the price. Jesus asked them very plainly in verse 38. I want you to go back there in Mark uh, chapter 10 and look at that in verse 38. He asked the question, can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Now, do you know what Jesus is asking them? He's saying, are you willing to suffer because of me? Now, folks, listen, I've had a few jobs in my lifetime. Never in an interview has anyone ever said to me, I am going to be your leader. I am going to be attacked. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be lied about. I'm going to be sped upon. Are you willing to have people do that to you as well because you are under my leadership? I'd probably get up and run out of the interview if they said that. I would think, well, what kind of person am I getting ready to work for? Well, the truth of the matter is, that's the world we live in. But Jesus is taking this from a spiritual standpoint, and he is saying, I'm going to die, guys. Are you really willing to suffer the way that I suffer? And James and John very quickly spoke up and stood up, and they said, absolutely, Jesus, we are ready to do whatever it takes. Now, Church history tells us that John was the only of the disciples that died of old age. But do you know John was banished to the Isle of Patmos? And while he was there, they boiled him in a pot of oil trying to kill him in a slow death. He miraculously lived. I would say John was willing to pay the price. James was murdered by Herod. He didn't run from it. He knew that it was coming. And so these men knew that there was going to be a price in serving Jesus, but they was willing to pay that price. Now keep in mind, at this point, we're talking about leadership. Are we a person of vision? Are we people willing to pay the price? Well, there's a third characteristic that's found in true leaders, godly leaders. And I want you to write this down as well. They weren't afraid of being unpopular. They were not afraid of being unpopular. I do not want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. That doesn't mean as a leader that you have a right to be arrogant. That's not what that means at all, and Jesus did not fit that description. But following Jesus would make them unpopular. And so James and John were, at, uh, were what most people would consider, I think, the ideal leaders. And you know, Jesus didn't scold them when they said, hey, can we sit on your right or can we sit on your left? Most of us would think Jesus would look at them and say, guys, slow down on the ambition there. I'm getting ready to die. But he didn't say that. He just kind of redirected their ambition. Now, for you and I as a Christian to desire to achieve greatness in the kingdom of God is a good thing. I would hope all of you would desire that to some degree. But let's move from being a leader now to another word I want to talk about, and that is being a servant. The word servant is found many times in the New Testament. It's the Greek word doulos that uh, simply translates bond servant. Do you know that it is impossible to be a godly leader if you are not a servant? In fact... You must be a servant, and that's what Jesus said. Look at verse 33 of Mark chapter 10. I do not want you to miss this, and there's one word there that I want you to circle and understand in verse 43. He said, but if so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. Now that word minister is translated in the Greek language, deaconos. It's where we get the word deacon. It's where we get the word servant, because that's what deacons are. They are servants. Ministers are servants. We have many ministers in the church. I'm a pastor. That's different from just being a minister. The word minister simply means servant. And so when we look at verse 43, what we find is Jesus is saying, you're saying you want to be great. James and John, 
One wants to sit on the right side, one wants to sit on the left side. He says the only way you can be great is not by sitting there, but by learning to become a servant. In fact, Jesus said in verse 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Amen. All right. Very quickly, I want to show you something. We talk about leaders. We talk about great leaders. We see the prestige that comes with someone being the leader. But Jesus teaches us that you and I cannot be a true biblical leader without understanding what it means to be a servant. Now I want to summarize this whole message up in, in one sentence. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, why did you do that at the beginning? We can do that more eating right now. And uh, you can save us a lot of time. Well. I knew that I spent the time preparing this, so you'd want to hear it. So, to sum up this entire message in one sentence is this, and write this down if you, if you take notes. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you must spend your life focusing on what you give, not what you get. Let me say that again. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you must spend your life focusing on what you give, not what you get. Now let me just say, most of the time when a pastor stands up and talks about giving, immediately people say, oh, he's talking about money. Well, you know I very seldom hardly ever talk about money unless we're preaching specifically uh, about that subject. So the question is, how does that apply to our life? Well, let me give you three ways here. This is what being a true servant really means. At the end of the message, I'm going to ask you this question. Are you a true biblical leader? And you will only be able to say yes if you can say, I am a true biblical servant. All right? Being a servant means this. Number one, jot this down. You must be willing to work without a guarantee. Now, how do you like that? Who wants to sign up for that? Yes, I'm willing to work. Even though there's no guarantee. I go back to that interview that I talked about later. I walk in and, and I'm giving an interview. And the uh, uh, person interviewing me says, now listen, Sean, we know you can do a great job. We think you will do a great job. Uh, you're probably going to be spat upon. You know, you're going to be talked about. You're going to be mocked because you're under my leadership. And oh, by the way, there's no guarantee in any of this that any of this is going to work out. Again, who would be the first one to say, yep, that sounds like something I want to do? That goes totally against the mindset of the way that we think. Now, I know you can't do that totally on, on your job, but in a, when we're talking about the kingdom of God, you must be willing to work without a guarantee. What does that mean? Well, James and John tried to negotiate a good deal for themselves. James and John were the typical Christians. Jesus, I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to be spat upon. People can mock me. I don't care what they say about me. I just have one little request. When we get to heaven, let me sit on your right, and he can sit on your left. And Jesus said, yeah, that's okay. You know what those guys would have done? They would have argued about who sat on the right and who sat on the left. <laughs> that's just human nature. But they said, sure, we'll pay the price. We'll, we'll do the work. And in return, just recognize, give us the recognition that we deserve it. Now notice this, folks, because Jesus says it doesn't work that way. Let's take this in the, in the sense of in the church now. How does this work in, in the church? You pay the price. Do you expect to get rewarded for that? Do you expect to get the prestige from that? Every person that wants to achieve greatness in the kingdom of God must let go of their desire for recognition. It's one of the first things a pastor has to learn. God may use you to be a Billy Graham, but he may not. God may use you to pastor some old up church that has 10 people. It wouldn't make a difference if you were preaching to 100,000 or you're preaching to 10. You love them the same way. You treat them the same way. Well, it's more prestigious to be the type of pastor that has the, the larger church. And believe me, there's many today that are chasing after that. You know, there are people in our church today, and I can honestly say this, that do things here every single week that no one knows about. And they don't expect to thank you. 
and probably most people will never go up to them and say, I just want to thank you for your service and the things that you do in this church. Listen, if you want to serve God, you must be willing to work without a guarantee because much of your life you're going to spend living the Christian life. And people are not going to say thank you. They're not going to pat you on the back and say you're doing a great job. Being a servant means you must be willing to work without a guarantee. How's that sound so far? Well, we have two more. Number two, you must be willing to pay the price, just like we said with John and James. Jesus told John and James that they were going to suffer. Verse 39, he says, You shall drink the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with, you're going to be baptized with. Now they understood his meaning. And they knew that this was not going to be an easy road. But they were willing to do it anyway. So that brings me to a question today. Are you willing to pay the price, whatever it would be? I cannot tell you how many students, back when I taught in Bible college, uh, after Bible college, um, I cannot tell you how many young pastors would dream of one day having a big church, or they would dream one day of having this, this great congregation, and I just knew my, in my heart that this was just not going to work. Because the way Jesus teaches us to identify leadership is, if you're willing to do the small things, then he can reward you with the great things. If you come walking in the door thinking you should have, and that's our society today, I, everything is owed to me. In Luke chapter 41, verse 17, the Bible says, Jesus said, you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. It's not fair, but it's the way that it is. Go back to leadership. If you are in a role of lead, as, a, as a leader, it makes no difference how good you may be as a leader. Do you know there's always going to be somebody that thinks you're the worst leader they ever had? I mean, have any of you ever had a job? I'm assuming you work sometime in your life. You can acknowledge this. You've been in leadership roles, and you gave it your best, and you poured your heart into it. And what happens, somebody comes in, and they try to earn your reputation, and you're just thinking, all I want to do is be a good leader. Well, Jesus taught us some principles about that. And that is, you must be willing to work without a guarantee. You must be willing to pay the price. Third and final thing this morning. You must be committed to meeting the needs of others. I want you to go back to verse 42. And we'll close with this. Jesus said this to his disciples in verse 42. You know that they are they which accounted, uh, accounted to rule over the Gentiles, exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Some people lead because they want to be the boss. They want people to know who they are. They want people to, when they walk in the room, they want that awe factor. They want all the heads to turn towards them and everybody go, wow. I can honestly say that's never happened in my life. I don't even get an applause. I get an applause when I'm done occasionally. But I've never got an applause whenever I've walked to the pulpit. Nobody's just ever been, wow. And that's okay because that's not the way that it should be. Some people want to lead because they simply want to help other people. If you want an easy life, let me just say this. As a Christian, don't expect it. If you're looking for an easy life, there's no such thing as an easy life for the Christian. And that's contrary to much teaching that you'll hear today is that, you know, you'll be wealthy and you'll never be sick and uh, the list goes on and on and on. But I go back to this very important point. Jesus never criticized the ambition of James and John. He just redirected it. He said, guys, you're, you're thinking about this all wrong. See, we should not turn our backs on the idea that we can't have ambition as Christians. That even in a secular world that we can't lead. We should never have that idea. Greatness is something every believer should want to achieve. And by the way, on our jobs, we should be the one that people look at and say, that's what every employee should be. And that will probably get some of us hard today. Because most people end up hating their jobs and they just can't wait till retirement. Many of you have been there, uh, but it's not too late. 
But our employers should be able to look at us and say, not only are they a Christian, but they're the best employee that we've ever had. You see, God's way is that you become great by serving others. How does that look like? What does that look like? You know, I said being, being a Christian and serving in Christian ministry, people will not always come up to you and thank you for things that you do. There are things every week that happen in this church, and they don't just happen. Do you realize someone came in this morning and turned on the heat? They turned on the lights? They got, and what me? I'm not saying that for me. Believe me, <laughs> I, I, that's definitely not me. Not that I wouldn't do it, but I'm just saying that's not what I do. But I wonder when the last time somebody just spoke up and found that person and said, hey, I, I want to just apologize. I take for granted every week when I come in here in the wintertime and this building's warm. Well, you know what we will do? I can't believe it's so hot here today. How do you think it is out there? How cold do you think it is? It's always easy to complain. And I'm not preaching to the choir right now because I'm preaching to you because I'm the guy that you say it to. So I know I'm telling the truth today. Always easy to complain. You know what a servant leader will do? You know what a servant will do? A servant will be an encourager to others. A servant will find ways to build people up, not tear them down. A servant doesn't come in saying, I want to be the greatest. I want everybody to see me. A servant doesn't worry about the recognition they get in this life. They knew what, know what they're doing. They're doing it for the glory of God. Here's a question I want to ask you today. Really, it's a statement I want to make. And that is that we need leaders who are focused on what they give, not what they get. We need some folks in our church that's going to say, listen, my time on this earth is limited. I want to serve. No one ever may think I'm a great leader, and that's okay. But when I stand before God, I want to hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. So here's the practical part to this message today. If you stood before God today, would he say to you, well done? Or would he say you could have done things a little better? You could have done things a little different. So search your heart today. Ask yourself, why do I do the things? that I do? Is it to bring honor and glory to God? Or is it to bring honor and glory to myself? Be a good servant. Find those that serve. And, and folks, I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about those in our church that serve. Seek them out. Thank them for the things that they do. And by the way, if you don't like the way they do it, then sign up to help. Yeah. Well, that would be a good first step. Yeah. One for the yeah. pastor. <laughs> So let's ask ourselves today, God, what are you trying to say to us today? How can we be better servants today? We you ask yourself that question, and we you do something about it? Let's stand together as we pray. Father, we thank you today, Lord, for the opportunity that we have. Lord, we just thank you that we can come to you humbly. And we can realize that we are all fallen human beings. Lord, it should be our desire every day to serve you better. And Lord, I realize that it's so easy for us to come into a service such as this and we can just hear a message and uh, just go home and not think about anything that's been said and not apply it to our life. But Lord, regardless of what stage we are in our life, we're never too old to learn to become a better servant. So Lord, help us to focus on that today. There's really two things we need to ask ourselves. Today we need to say, God, am I serving you the way that I should in the capacity that I should? Am I doing for you, for the kingdom of God, the things that I should be doing? And then secondly, Lord, we need to ask ourselves the question, what is my motive behind doing those things? Am I doing it so people will think how great I am? Or am I doing it, Lord, so that one day you will be pleased? Lord, whatever area of leadership we have, whether it's in the church, whether it's in the home, whether it's on the job, as I said, we all have different areas of leadership. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to do it well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing our invitation song, if you need to come this morning, this altar is always open. I invite you to come as we sing.